The subcommittee will reconvene, and as I promised, we will begin with our second panel. Let me introduce each of you. Um, first is uh, Chairman Buford Rowland, who is Vice Chairman and Nashville Area Representative for the National Indian Health Board and also Chairman of the Porch Band Creek Indians. Thank you for being here. Then we have Dr. Robert Goldstein, who is Senior Vice President for Scientific Affairs of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, and Dr. Robert R. Henry, who is President-Elect Medicine and Science for the American Diabetes Association, Professor of Medicine at the University of California Department of Medicine, and Chief of the Section of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Diabetes at the VA Medical Center in uh, San Diego. I need to mention to the panel that um, Chairman Rowland um, is going to testify and then leave uh, because he has to catch a plane in previous commitments, uh, but he will take uh, written questions. And the way we work is I think, you know, we have five minutes opening from each of you, and then we take questions, but um, you can submit additional written statements if you like, and then members may also uh, follow up with some written questions as well. So we'll start with Chairman Rowland. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Buford Rowland, Chairman of the Porch Band of Creek Indians and Vice Chairman of the National Indian Health Board. I also serve as the co-chair of the Tribal Leaders Diabetes Committee. And on I'm not sure, Chairman, that your mic is on. Is it Mr. green? Then you have to bring it a little closer then. Okay, can yeah, you hear me? There we go. Thanks. Thank you. Shall I, I'll just begin that way. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Buford Rowland, Chairman of the Porch Band of Creek Indians and Vice Chairman of the National Indian Health Board. I also serve as the co-chair of the Tribal Leaders Diabetes Committee. And on a personal note, I have lived with diabetes for the last six years. Thank you for inviting NIHB to participate in this important hearing. I apologize, but I must leave early to catch a flight. Today, American Indians and Alaska Natives suffer disproportionately from diabetes. Indian adults are two times more likely to have diabetes compared with the non-Hispanic whites. In some tribal communities, more than half of the adults have been diagnosed with diabetes. Sadly, the highest rate of diabetes diagnosis has occurred among our young children and young adults. From 1990 to 2009, young Native people ages 25 through 34 years experienced a 161% increase in diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. In addition, diagnosis of diabetes rose 110% in our teenagers 15 to 19 years old during the same period. Despite these alarming statistics, progress is being made. This progress would not have been possible without the Special Diabetes Program for Indians. Congress created the SDPI in 1997 in the wake of increasing public concern about the burden of diabetes in Native communities. In 1998, the Indian Health Service established the Tribal Leaders Diabetes Committee to provide guidance on SDPI, diabetes, and related chronic diseases. Today, through SDPI, IHS provides funding and support for diabetes prevention and treatment programs, services, and activities to over 450 IHS tribal and urban Indian SDPI programs. And it is working. Diabetes-related health outcomes have improved significantly in Native communities since the launch of SDPI. For example, 11%, there's 11% decrease in the blood sugar level, A1C, in Indian people who have been diagnosed with diabetes. This decrease translates to a 40% reduction in diabetes-related complications such as blindness, kidney failure, nerve disease, and amputations. 16% increase in total cholesterol uh, level, of total cholesterol level, and a decrease of 20% in blood uh, and bad cholesterol. 
Research has shown that lowering cholesterol levels reduces the risk of developing complications associated with diabetes, such as heart attacks, strokes, or heart failure. 32% decrease of the prevalence of protein in urine and a risk in the kidney disease. New cases of diabetes-related dialysis in Indian people decreased 31% between 1999 and 2007, while remaining relatively unchanged in other races. Preventing kidney failure is critical to help people with diabetes avoid needy dialysis or kidney transplants. In addition, SDPI has enabled the IHS tribal and urban Indian programs to provide expanding screening, prevention, and diabetes treatment services as well as to build a desperately needed infrastructure. The committee should also know that the outcomes of the SDPI and knowledge gained through these scientific-based programs have helped to inform and advance other IHS diabetes programs, such as the Model Diabetes Program established under the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. The 19 model diabetes programs in the Indian Health System have made significant contributions, including state-of-the-art comprehensive clinical diabetes care through a multidisciplinary preventing and treatment approach. The Special Diabetes Program for in Indians has been life-saving to people who have diabetes, life-changing to those who have avoided diabetes because of early detection and prevention efforts. And perhaps most importantly, it is helping to ensure a diabetes-free future for our children and future generations. Making real progress in this area and ensuring that future generations will be free of the burden of this disease requires federal and tribal government collaboration. We have shown it can work. Now we need to recommit ourselves and this hearing is a good first step. On behalf of the National Indian Health Board, thank you for this opportunity to address the subcommittee regarding this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you. I know that uh, you have to leave, but I, I do appreciate your testimony, and I, I want you to know that um, I speak for myself, but I think I can speak for everyone in saying that, you know, we're particularly conscious of the impact of diabetes on the Native American community and want to help in any way we can to, you know, deal with this epidemic. I appreciate your comments. Dr. Goldstein. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm Robert Goldstein, Senior Vice President of Scientific Affairs for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. I'm honored to be here today before this distinguished committee with my colleagues from the diabetes community. JDRF is the largest charitable funder and advocate of diabetes research worldwide. Since our founding 40 years ago by parents of children with type 1 diabetes, JDRF has awarded more than $1.4 billion to diabetes research. Type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes, is an autoimmune disease for which there is no cure, at least not yet. It is the second most common chronic disease affecting children. It is growing rapidly, particularly in our youngest children. Diabetes overall costs our nation more than $174 billion a year, and one in three Medicare dollars is spent on people with the disease. But the good news is that we are moving faster toward a cure for type 1 diabetes than ever before, thanks to a strong federal commitment to diabetes research funding, as well as JDRF's private investment. A key component of the federal investment is the Special Diabetes Program, which provides a critical 35% of NIH funding for type 1 diabetes research and supports the multi-center human clinical trials that are contributing to discovering better treatments. Let me highlight some of the key advances which benefit not only those with type 1 diabetes, but those with type 2 diabetes and other autoimmune diseases. Researchers have discovered ways to slow the autoimmune attack that causes type 1 diabetes. Charlotte Cunningham, a 15-year-old from Maryland, was able to produce her own insulin for three years after receiving a drug treatment called anti-CD3, and today is better able to control her blood glucose levels. 
Great strides have been made in investigating therapies to regenerate and replace insulin-producing cells. Thanks to this research and Seidel de Merck of Texas and now California, who received an islet transplantation, no longer suffers from frequent low blood sugar episodes, which impacted her ability to care for her young son, who unfortunately also has type 1 diabetes. Researchers have paired continuous glucose monitors with insulin pumps to develop an artificial pancreas to help those with type 1 more easily and accurately control their blood glucose levels. A study recently published in The Lancet found an early artificial pancreas system lowered the risk of low blood sugar emergencies in children and teenagers while they were asleep. Researchers have recently found a way to reverse diabetic eye disease, the leading cause of adult onset blindness. Sally Cartwright, a 66-year-old type 2 patient, can now drive thanks to a treatment combining a drug and laser treatment. As this progress shows, diabetes research is one of the world's most effective public-private partnerships focused on curing a particular disease. Yet despite tremendous advances, there is still much work to be done. On behalf of JDRF and the millions of families affected by diabetes, I thank the committee for its leadership and strong support for the special diabetes program, which is a key element of our continued success. We deeply appreciate your commitment and look forward to continuing to work with you to cure this devastating and costly disease. Thank you again for holding the hearing. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Dr. Henry? Well, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to Chairman Pallone and uh, Ranking Member Shimkus for holding this hearing. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the American Diabetes Association. My full written testimony has been submitted for the record, and in the five minutes I have, I will summarize it. <coughs> I've just come from the American Diabetes Association's 70th Scientific Sessions Conference in Orlando, Florida, the world's largest diabetes research meeting, where over 14,000 diabetes researchers, providers, and educators gather to hear and discuss the latest in diabetes research. The CDC has identified diabetes as a disabling, deadly epidemic that is on the rise. Between 1980 and 2007, the prevalence of diabetes has increased by 300 percent. Its total cost is over $218 billion a year. The association is grateful to the committee for supporting vital HHS diabetes programs, including the NIDDK, CDC's DDT, and the Indian Health Service. Because of this investment, our knowledge of the disease has been expanded, and the critical work towards epi ending this epidemic can continue. Our efforts have, sig have significantly changed the way diabetes is addressed in both the clinical and community setting. Since 1952, more than 4,000 research projects on type 1, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes have been funded by the American Diabetes Association. In 2009, the association awarded $33.55 million in new research support. We strive particularly to bring research from bench to the bedside and swiftly into the hands of patients and care providers. We fund cutting-edge research. Association-funded work developed the first handheld blood glucose meters, a key tool to achieving diabetes control. Currently. Our research has found a potential new treatment for diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, a complication that makes diabetes the number one cause of adult onset blindness. We value our partnerships with key health organizations, and I'm pleased to point to our continued work with JDRF in the development of an artificial pancreas that holds a promise of revolutionizing diabetes management for type 1 diabetes. We are committed to developing the pipeline of diabetes researchers including funding younger researchers and more minority investigators to ensure the vitality of future research. We've made great progress, but more has to be done. With this in mind, I want to outline several key next steps in the battle to stop diabetes. <coughs> more attention must be paid to the pressing needs of special populations, particularly affected by the diabetes epidemic, including minority populations. We remain steadfast in our efforts to support research that, ad that addresses these disparities. H.R. 3668, sponsored by Representatives uh, Diana DeGette and Mike Castle, helps address this issue by renewing the Special Diabetes Program. 
s d s d p programs in american indians and american native communities and s d p funded type one research are highly successful the program expires in two thousand and eleven and i urge congress to pass this legislation soon so this work can continue h r nine hundred ninety five the eliminating disparities in diabetes prevention access and care act also seeks to address racial and ethnic health disparities related to diabetes. We thank Representative DeGette again for introducing this bill and Representative Donna Christensen for including it in the tri caucuses health disparities legislation. We also must increase efforts to prevent and treat gestational diabetes. Repre representatives Elliot Engel and Michael Burgess have sponsored H.R. 5354, the Gestational Diabetes Act, which aims to lower the incidence of gestational diabetes in order to protect mother and baby and prevent future cases of type 2 diabetes. Our collective fight to stop diabetes must be continued. Your leadership in combating this growing epidemic is absolutely essential. Thank you for your commitment to the diabetes community, and it would be my pleasure to answer any questions you might have on these important issues. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Henry. We're going to have questions from the panel, and I'll start with myself. Um, Dr. Goldstein, can you explain how um, the promising research you're doing with the NIH and the private sector on, the, on initiatives like the continuous glucose monitor, artificial pancreas was mentioned several times, uh, how these are going to better control diabetes and the diseases associated costs and complications, because we know you know, the, the costs are unbelievable. One out of three Medicare dollars is spent on diabetes. Um, Mr. Chairman, and, and the I asked Dr. Henry to comment as well. The uh, NIH supported DCCT study in 1993 for the first time demonstrated that high quality, tight control of the blood sugar variations resulted in improvements. Over time, those patients have now been studied for 20 years. And the complication rates have just dropped from very large numbers to 15 and 20 percent numbers. So that the reduction in complication rate from just in exerting tight control has been enormous. With the continuous glucose monitors, we've upped the ante because patients can now achieve high quality tight control with lower risk for getting blood sugars that are too low and with just an improvement in the overall quality of life because they don't have to concern themselves so much with measuring blood sugar six, seven, eight times a day. So the JDRF supported a study that was published a couple of years ago that showed you could drive the hemoglobin A1C down, which is directly correlated to reduction in complication rates. And we're in the phase now where we're working with everybody we can find, industry, uh, other organizations, to implement high quality tight control in as many patient populations as possible, ranging from children, adolescents, pregnancy. We're just uh, beginning to start there. And the idea is while we're waiting for a cure, we want people to implement very high quality control of their diabetes so that they'll be in good enough health when the cure does appear. All right, Dr. Henry, you can answer that. Also, I wanted to ask you a question too. Uh, separately about the association's role as a government partner and how you strike a balance in addressing the needs of the different types of diabetes, you know, type 1, type 2, gestational. So if you want to follow up on him and then get into that. Well, I would say with, uh, I, I agree with everything that, that uh, Dr. Goldstein has stated. And clearly w the, um, the goal for an artificial pancreas is to make it easier to be able to regulate the blood glucose within the normal limits. And as you heard, <coughs> Complications are minimal or minimized by good glycemic control, particularly low blood sugars, hypoglycemia, which can have devastating consequences, as well as persistent high blood sugars, which leads to complications. So these can be minimized by a feedback between understanding the blood glucose levels and, um, and in, in injections of, of insulin. The other thing that we found that, that the DCT research, the long term, the, the uh, funded by the uh, and IDDK data showed is that there were a, a legacy effect, so that controlling diabetic 
patients today with type one diabetes had effects on cardiovascular disease beneficial effects on cardiovascular disease ten years later so that there was just short term the study lasted for several years but even ten years later there were significant benefits so i think that it emphasizes that good control now has will will not only reduce the long term consequences but they will they will have sustained benefits for many many years in terms of of the the second question can i ask you to repeat that i may forego that because i did want to ask something else i know you know i'm so interested in the issue as it affects the native americans and chairman roland left but i just wanted to ask you know he he gave me the impression that that uh, we really were getting a handle on diabetes amongst uh, American Indians. Uh, is that, is that I, mean, uh, I mean, obviously there is some success, but you know, my recollection just talking to different tribes is that the incidence of, of diabetes is still on the increase, and particularly amongst younger people. Uh, how do I reconcile that with what he said? I mean, he's not here, so it's difficult. But Sure, I'd be happy to. He, uh, I think, I think you're correct that the prevalence continues to rise in the Indian um, and the and the uh, Native Alaskan population. However, we're doing a better job of taking control of those people, so they're lasting, uh, they're they're living longer, but we're doing a better job of of preventing the complications. So more people are still contracting diabetes, but you're able to control it and make them live longer. And, and many of the complications of the nerves and of the kidneys and the eyes, we've made sub substantial progress in reducing those. So uh, while there has been significant progress, as he states, uh, the prevalence of the disease does continue to rise, though. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Shimkus? Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And uh, I, I want to, uh, uh, Dr. Goldstein and uh, Dr. Henning, you can chime in, too. Uh, uh, in your uh, op in your statement, um, you talked about uh, the islet uh, technology and, and use, and I know in the early part of the decade uh, there was widespread media reports on the promise of this, um, especially those with type one diabetes, and help fully living. Um, the hope was that they would have be able to live without daily injections of insulin. And you did talk, you briefly mentioned uh, one case. What is the, the promise of <coughs> the islet use? So the pancreatic islet transplantation study you're referring to, which was uh, reported from Canada in the year 2000, was widely heralded and adopted. Uh, and NIH studied it, and the initial promise probably exceeded what could be delivered. But the long-term promise is quite interesting. So if we prepare islets from a donor, cadaveric donor pancreas and transplant that into somebody who's got relatively severe disease, typically with what's called hypoglycemia unawareness where they don't know that they're getting low blood sugars and could be prone to seizures and that sort of thing. The islet transplant actually reverses the hypoglycemia unawareness even if you still have to take insulin. And for those patients who have had to continue to take insulin, the quality of their uh, treatment has improved so much, and two complications have begun to reverse, one in the eyes and one in the nerves. So it's had an uh, important conceptual effect, which we call a proof of concept, that cell therapy or replacement therapy can actually work. That kind of replacement therapy requiring lifelong immunosuppression to prevent graft rejection is not exactly what we'd like to give to our children. So we need improvements on that, and hopefully this will lead the way towards the next generation of, of uh, productivity. Great. Dr. Henry, you want to add anything to that? Well, I would only say that at the, there was a, a large number of uh, symposia at this recent ADA meeting in uh, Orlando which addressed islet cell um, rejection and, and techniques to prevent rejection, uh, techniques to stimulate other um, cells to become islet cells. Uh, and so I think that this is a, a very um, sort of stimulating area of research that is currently ongoing. Dr. Goldstein, you mentioned also in your um, um, your statement, uh, not the written, but when you were talking, uh, anti-CD3. Can yes. you elaborate on that? Can I divert your attention for 30 seconds? Uh, it happens all the time. So, <laughs> uh, m Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess talked about a soldier who was injured by blast injury 
and was losing his pancreas surgically to save his life in other ways. That pancreas went to one of the islet transplantation programs in Miami. They recovered the islets from this soldier's damaged pancreas, sent them to Walter Reed. They were transplanted back. And he now has function and doesn't have diabetes because of that traumatic event. That couldn't have happened if there weren't a facility that understood how to prepare those islets. Th let me tell you about anti-CD3 in a moment, please. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where the immune system reacts in an abnormal way. If we can stop that autoimmune response, we presumably can stop the attack on the insulin-producing cell. Anti-CD3 is a monoclonal antibody which blocks the autoantibody response. If you give it to Charlotte Cunningham within four or five weeks of the time she got the disease and blocked that autoimmune response, her body stops destroying insulin secreting cells. And she keeps them functional now almost up to four years. Great, then that's, uh, that's always good news on uh, hopefully uh, future um, uses. Uh, and I'll just end with this and uh, just uh, go, Dr. Goldstein, I know that uh, the, uh, on the, your, the charity, JDRF, has a good ratio of money spent out versus overhead costs. And I was going to ask questions, but I'll just place that on the record because we do know that um, you're good stewards of the donations. And I put on the record uh, a family who, especially since I got elected to Congress, who've just been all over me, and they have two. Their, their youngest boy was a, uh, a Kevin uh, Covarubias. He's been up here for the Congress years ago. And what was was challenging and, and is that he, he, as a young, young boy, was identified. Then his brother, who was older, only was identified after his, in his late teens, like 18 or 19 years old, which uh, I guess had Ryan appreciate what Kevin went through for all those years. So uh, my ha hat's off to the Covarubias family for, for doing the work in the, in the field, too. And I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Deguette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both of you for coming and for all of the work of your organizations. Um, I, uh, you know, I was getting a lot of thanks up here, but really it's you and, and your partners at the federal agencies that are doing all the work and all of the families, too. Uh, whenever Mr. Space and Ms. Capps and, and the chairman and I and everybody will tell you that um, that when uh, even Mr. Shimkus will tell you that that when uh, these families come up to the Hill to testify and to talk to members, it's the most powerful, powerful evidence that we get up here. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want to follow up on a couple of questions. Um, uh, both of you were talking about the islet cell transplantation work that has been done. and. I just think it's it's worth noting as well as the anti-rejection issues. The other issue that we have right now with using the, the islet cells from cadavers is that the supply is, is even if you could figure out the, the rejection issues, you would have such a low supply of existing islet cells that you couldn't possibly treat the existing population. So I'm wondering if either of you or both of you would like to comment on that. Well, my comment would be that um, <coughs> well, that may that is um, likely to be true. The uh, the options of stem cells, I think, is really a true one. And and uh, uh, while we'll still have to get around the rejection issue because that's been sort of the thorn in the side of of getting right. a cure, I think that stem cells still hold significant promise. And in that and regard. that's because that's because with the stem cells you can actually make new cells versus the existing research where you have to just collect them. And I and hopefully Im yeah. immune tolerance so that they don't right. they don't get rejected. Right. Um, let, let me ask you um, uh, along those lines. The the um, NIH recent recent work of of um, trying to approve new cell lines is that sufficient to be doing the research that that's out there right now on the stem cell research and uh, what about this issue of of um, uh, having cell lines that might have the genetic predisposition towards diabetes what's the status from your perspective as private organizations? 
the, uh, there are now many approved lines for NIH funding. We think that's terrific. There are alternative sources for new lines from induced pluripotent stem cells, which are excellent resources. And disease-specific lines are being produced, for example, at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute with the technique of induced pluripotent stem cells. And they're making the cells available for study by researchers. They include genetic, rare genetic disorders as well as things like type 1 diabetes. So I would say the rate-limiting event today is funding for research to take advantage of the available material more than we need to make even more material this week. Yeah, because, because um, not only did we have President Obama's expansion of the embryonic stem cell research, but just in the last few years we had discovery of the iPS cells. And so now we need the funding to, to capitalize on that. I just have one more question uh, for both of you, which is um, uh, the, a, a lot of the, your testimony and the previous panel's testimony was around this concept of an artificial pancreas. And of course, I f as, a, as the parent of a diabetic, I follow these, these research um, developments with interest. Um, and I think the closed loop system will be the, the next big step. What, how far away are we, though, from really developing to, 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 to being able to get uh, clinical trials of the closed loop system and then to actually have it be widely available for folks? Well, there have been some clinical trials that have already been conducted and have shown efficacy in small numbers of patients. I think the, the difficulty right now is, is having sufficient funds to be able to do it in large, more larger populations uh, of patients and, of course, to um, um, research to needed to make it more um, uh, user-friendly. Right now, the, art, the artificial pancreases that, were, that have been studied are still bulky and large and they're very effective, uh, but not particularly adaptable to everyday life, and that's what we have to strive to do. But I think we're, we're certainly heading in the right direction, uh, moving quickly, but um, not perhaps not quickly enough. Dr. Goldstein? Uh, the, the technology is a bit cumbersome at the moment. Not every teenager likes to wear it. And if we can package that and shrink it and make it more user-friendly and get more widespread use, we'll be able to take advantage of current technology. We need improvements. We're funding work that's going ahead full blazes in, in terms of understanding how to set a, an algorithm to describe an exercise situation or sleeping at night situation or, or the infinite variety of details that a person might go through. <coughs> but our notion is that to whatever extent we can automate the technology, we'll get those tough-to-treat patient populations right. like adolescents and teenagers to use the technology, right? and that'll make it better for everybody. Thank you. I'm going to try to finish, guys. I know you'll have five minutes each, which is fine, because we have not only a series of votes, but also a motion to recommit, so it'll probably be at least an hour. So we're going to try to finish. Uh, so we'll go to Ms. Capps next. Thank you very much for your testimony and also for your patience getting through this very long day. Two questions for each of you, and they can be brief, and we can move to Dr. Mr. Space. One um, couple for Dr. Goldstein. Uh, in your testimony, you state that type 1 diabetes strike typically strikes in childhood, adolescent, or young adulthood. Then you note that the incident has increased particularly among children under 4. I wonder if you could um, briefly Give us a couple of reasons that for that, if they're known. I wish I could give you a couple. Of <laughs> no. Uh, or some kind of I should say information. two things quickly. About half the cases come in people 20 years old and older. So type 1 diabetes is not, strictly speaking, a, only a disease of children. Right, right. Uh, what's happened from the epidemiologic studies in the past five years from both Europe and the United States is, unfortunately, we're seeing it in younger and younger children in a more aggressive version. Right. And since nothing much has changed in the genetic structure of people, the assumption is that's related to something in the environment. So studies are focusing on identifying a theoretical virus that could do that, okay. some antigen within your body. That so there is no it. clear uh, path no. or, uh, and, and therefore we need a lot more research in this area. We do. Okay. Let me move on because you described also the disproportionate burden of type 2 and gestational diabetes on certain groups. Um, I wonder if this also holds true for type 1, 
Uh, and can you tell us whether there are certain age groups beyond children under four that are particularly affected by type one diabetes? And uh, you know, with with ethnic, racial, whatever kind of groups that well, that you have today, understood. Uh, Type 1 diabetes appears to be an equal opportunity okay. disease, and it, the, the, the numbers are fairly similar across ethnic groups. Where, where it's extremely important, for example, is in, uh, let's say, Los Angeles. If we'd like to get the technology into certain areas of Los Angeles to treat ethnic groups with type 1, that's a tour de force because that's not easily done without an army of educators and third-party pay, et cetera. So we're, we have... We have some of our artificial pancreas researchers working there on that. That's that's a hope for the future. I see. So it's going to depend on some other things. Maybe that will segue into uh, uh, questions that I have for you, Dr. Henry. These could have been interchanged <laughs> with either each of you. The, uh, earlier today, uh, Dr. Albright was talking about, the, in, in testimony, that CDC is actively working with the First Lady and Let's Move. Uh, that campaign to provide expertise in uh, healthy eating and physical activity as a way to deal with uh, diabetes. Um, and and uh, they are also sponsoring the Diabetes CDC as the Diabetes Prevention Program Master Trainer Curriculum. I'm particularly interested in types of prevention, research, and activities that will really work, and that ties into areas like that they would work with, with, with particular uh, community groups. And uh, Dr. Henry, maybe you can tell us more about some e efforts uh, that you are, uh, y your organization is uh, getting behind and the advocacy community is working on in terms of outreach, uh, specifically how they're being tailored to meet the needs of individual communities. Yeah, I think uh, one of our, the major ways is, is in the application of the diabetes prevention program information, which um, was highly effective, as you know, a 58 percent reduction in the development of diabetes in individuals who were able to lead a healthy lifestyle. So clearly you, one can make big inroads in, in that. Now the task has now been to take it to the community level. And that has been done, uh, the translational pro uh, part of that program has been uh, has been initiated and we're obviously uh, very supportive of that and has been done for a reasonable amount of money as you heard uh, in the range of 250 to 300 dollars per year per person which is uh, I think a, a reasonable um, amount of, of an expenditure. So I think that that's uh, right now where our major efforts are, are uh, going. But there are also many preventative and, and uh, efforts that are being directed truly at, at the pancreatic beta cell, which uh, not only does it, uh, does it uh, decline and, and, and cease in type, w in type 1 diabetes, but it declines progressively in type 2 and is a major contributor to uh, many of, of the uh, complications through poor glucose control. So there is, again, a great deal of research focusing on, on uh, preserving be the beta cell and preserving and, and also treating the insulin resistance that you heard about because we now know that there are efforts directed at treating the insulin resistance, whether it be through lifestyle modification or through medication, prolongs uh, the uh, pancreas and, and gives it a longer uh, period where it can produce sufficient insulin to maintain glucose control. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, both for being here today. And I certainly want to echo uh, the remarks of uh, my colleague, uh, Mrs. DeGette, regarding uh, how uh, valuable the work that both of your agencies uh, do is. Uh, I have, um, uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Henry, Dr. Henry, for you first. Um, your, your testimony references special populations as being especially uh, uh, prone to uh, uh, contracting diabetes. And there's been some talk today about um, ethnic minorities and Native Americans. And uh, there hasn't been much said, however, about uh, geographic and demographic uh, breakdowns. I, my district is in southeastern Ohio. It's Appalachian, Ohio. It's, um, it's a very poor, um, very rural uh, district that some of my counties have actually twice the incidence of diabetes uh, than the national average or even the statewide average. And I'd be interested in your thoughts as to whether um, those types of demographics, uh, location or access to health care facilities or poverty, whether or not uh, they have negatively influenced uh, uh, 
the uh, diabetes uh, incidence rate and whether your studies are accounting for that and what can be done to offset that. Yeah, I think that uh, it seems unquestionable that is the case and access to care is definitely one of, of um, uh, the limiting factors because in, in many cases there is, is prodrome, uh, not only obesity but different forms of obesity that precede the development of at least type 2 diabetes and, and individuals at risk for gestational diabetes. And certainly those populations, um, uh, uh, they need to be effectively treated uh, and, and have access to care. Uh, uh, just as well, I think that uh, healthy lifestyles are difficult when you're poor. It's, uh, it's very difficult to, to eat the, the fruits and vegetables that uh, uh, we hear, we've, we've talked about, and, and I think that that also increases the likelihood that individuals with uh, at genetic risk of diabetes, uh, which it is a clearly has a genetic component, um, are more likely to develop diabetes. So I think that those are real issues that, would probably that have to be addressed. And, uh, and I think that, that um, better access to preventative technology as well as, as uh, uh, better treatment of the comorbidities uh, will translate to a reduction in uh, the development of diabetes. Thank you. And, and Dr. Goldstein, uh, thank you, by the way, for meeting with me earlier today and taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, we have about two minutes, and I'd, I'd like your, uh, if you could give us just a very brief account of uh, how the NIH funding uh, works in conjunction with um, foundational funding that comes from sources like ADA and JDRF, and how it works in conjunction with industry sources of uh, funding for research and development uh, from uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies. So here's the two-minute version. Um, we work very closely with the NIH to, to do complementary things, so we're not funding the same things. And uh, I would say the most important piece of information is that the NIH, which has made a historically important investment in basic science and discovers new things. To develop those things, you have to pass them off as you, as you go along. So initially, new discoveries get in the hands of small companies. NIH has a modest program. JDRF has a modest program to encourage small companies to develop things. We like to nourish them along the pathway to get into proof of concept clinical trials which is about the first place that large pharma becomes interested after you've already got some data. And once you've got the data in a phase three trial, large pharma becomes very interested. So for example, the anti-CD3 I spoke about, two large pharmaceutical companies are both taking that to market. And it costs lots of money to do that. We can't afford to do it, nor can the ADA probably. Early on, NIH gets us the discovery but once you hit the small company level and the small biotech and the small investigators, the handful of people who are moving the, the next generation of science along, really hard to get money to do that these days. Venture capital has dried up. And the foundation world has said, that's a gap we need to think about filling. How could we do it wisely? And that's exactly where we're focusing our more limited resources in a, in a more strategic way. So we frankly pick and choose. We try to take something more promising and try to move it along to the point where it can either move or not. And that's a partnership that I would argue has served the United States of America very well in terms of being a model for how to do things for people. And at some point, the big clinical translation apparatus comes into play, and NIH has played an important role in doing that as well. Uh, thank we're you very much. to end. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to miss the votes. Listen, thank uh, my colleagues and, and both of you for, uh, for your uh, presentations. It was very helpful. The way we work is um, we have about 10 days to submit written questions, and particularly since Mr. Chairman Rowland had to leave, I'm sure there'll be some, and the clerk will send you those, and then we ask you to get back to us as quickly as possible. Uh, but again, thank you, and I know there's a lot more to be done on this issue, but at least we had a beginning here today. And without objection, this meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, sir. Did you get it? 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 Did